Thank you. Thanks very much for that very kind introduction and uh, thank you to the Programming Committee for inviting me here. It's an honour to be here in such a beautiful part of the world. Um, I wanted to give you an outline today. I'm going to compliment, I hope, Rory's talk in terms of broadening it to talk about new technologies more generally and how they can be used to support new and innovative approaches to learning. I'm going to start by talking about some of the characteristics of new media, new social and participatory media, as they're often referred to. And I'm going to talk about the notion of the co-evolution of tools and practice, how our practices as teachers, as learners, as researchers, are changing fundamentally as a result of, of the use of these new technologies. I'm then going to give you some examples of different pedagogies of e-learning, how different pedagogical approaches can be supported through these new technologies. I'm going to argue that we need a new digital literacies as teachers and as learners to make sense of these things, and that these, although have huge potential for learning, also result in some interesting technological challenges or paradoxes. And I'm going to put forward the notion of designing for learning in an open world as a means of addressing this, as a means of helping teachers make effective use of these technologies. And I'm going to support that through two examples of the way in which we've de been developing design visualisation and the way in which we've been developing various ways in which teachers can collaborate to design together. A little bit of background. Um, I'm originally a chemist by nature. I did a PhD in X-ray crystallography. Um, and I'm, I'm originally from Ireland, but was pretty much brought up in the UK. And I got into this area by exploring and experimenting with technologies, as probably quite a lot of us in this room uh, did as well. I've got a range of research interests. I'm interested in looking at both what learner and teacher's experiences of use of technologies are, what are the issues and challenges and the opportunities, new approaches to designing for learning. Like Rory, I have an interest in open educational resources, and we were talking this morning about that in the, in the panel session uh, through projects like OPAL, and Olnet in the Open University, and more broadly learning theories, new technologies, and strategic and policy imperatives of e-learning. Uh, the weather's are slightly different in the UK from here. Uh, I live in a very small village in um, Northamptonshire, and uh, Rory will laugh at this. If we get an inch, inch of snow, that's it, we're snowed in. The girls love it, so uh, unlike Canada, we, we, we don't cope very well with snow. Well, what's the broader context um, of this? We know that we're working in a rapidly changing technological environment. That's a fact. We need to take account of this. We need new digital literacy skills for both learners and teachers, and I'm going to come back and draw on the work of Henry Jenkins and colleagues in uh, the States. And we're seeing new open practices emerging, not only in terms of resources, but in terms of teaching practice, in terms of research, in terms of scholarship. And we're seeing new forms of online community and identity. Is that not good? Thank you. So what are these social and participatory media I've been referring to? Some work we carried out last year with Yota Alivizu and myself uh, as part of the HE Academy uh, uh, project, we categorised social and participatory into the following types. And I'm not going to go through these in detail, but I just wanted to put up on the screen to give you a feel for the very rich variety of different types of technologies that are available and ways in which we can interact with those, ways in which we can communicate with peers and with others. And we've seen a shift from the web, as web one as it was referred to, to web two. A shift from a web that was essentially static and passive to one which is active and participatory. And this draws with it a number of key characteristics. The ability to be able to peer critique, the ability to enable learners to generate their own content so that we are publishers, the ability to network on a truly global, global scale, the ability to adopt open practices, collectively aggregate with others and personalise. And I hope you can see very quickly these all have huge potential for learning. It's quite old now, but there's a YouTube video uh, from 2007 by Michael Wesch, who's a professor, associate professor in the States, called The Machine is Using Us. Really, if you haven't seen it, uh, well worth watching. Out of interest, how many people have seen that video? One. <laughs> Only a handful. Okay, so the rest of you, if you get a chance, a couple of minutes, it's really worth it. It really encapsulates, I think, the power of these technologies and their key characteristics. 
Well, what kinds of new online communities are emerging as a result of interaction with these tools and what, does it, what are their implications for learning? They provide us with new means of communicating, collaborating, sharing and co-constructing knowledge. I'll give you one example. How many of you use Twitter? Okay. So, um, in writing uh, this book that I'm doing, Designing for Learning in an Open World, you know what it's like? One reference, I couldn't find it. Didn't matter how hard I looked. 1972K, it was a conference proceeding. I knew it was in Minneapolis. I could not find the page references. I spent hours on Google trying to find it. And eventually I gave up, and as a last hope, I sent out a tweet and said, anybody know what the reference to this is? Five minutes, five replies, the correct answer. So that's really profound in terms of the way we can connect and network with others. We're seeing a range of different types of connections and communities. And um, uh, colleagues from Athabasca, John Dron and Terry Anderson have written a nice paper where they talk about and describe these different types of groups, networks and collectives as, as they refer to them. So what, what are these new kinds of online communities and how can we foster and support them in creative ways? New technologies also enable us to interact in new ways. Uh, increased interaction between learners and teachers, between learners and contexts. But these interactions are complex and on a number of different types of the, uh, themes as well as different types and purposes. But it's also been recognised by some colleagues that interactivity is important in a learning context. It enables us to be more engaged, motivated and helps us to persist in carrying on with our learning. And we see four types, more uh, initially defined the first three, learner, 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 tutor and learner content. And the fourth has been uh, added in terms of interaction between the learners and their interface. So I mentioned before that we have co-evolved uh, with these tools as we've changed our practice. Think back to your first use of email. You probably use email in a very, very different way now than when you first use it. And I'd like to draw on uh, Gibson's work from an ecological perspective in terms of the notion of affordances. And he defines it as all action possibilities latent in an environment, but always in relation to the actor and therefore dependent on their capability. For instance, a tall tree, I've argued, offers the affordance of food for a giraffe, but not for a sheep. So it's about this interrelationship between us and the tools. So the tools will have a set of affordances. They might afford uh, different forms of communication or reflection or connection or authenticity. And we also, as users, have a range of preferences, skills, interests, interest, as well as our own context. Again, how many of you have Facebook accounts? How many of you hate the idea of Facebook? So we have very, very strong and different views about these kind of technologies. We have different skills levels of how we interact with them. So it's not just about the characteristics of the tools, it's also about our characteristics and personal preference. And between that, we start to see evolving practice. Many people who use Twitter, for example, found it quite a while to get used to it before they had their own aha moment and saw the relevance of it. Um, Google now has a new tool uh, out called Google+. Plus. Again, how many people have played with Google+, Plus? not many. I can't quite see the point of it yet. I, I don't know about you guys. It hasn't really entered my daily practice. It doesn't really mean very much to me. Now, maybe it will or maybe it won't. It will depend over time. Jenkins talks about the kind of new digital literacies that we need to be part of what he refers to as a participatory culture in terms of utilising the power of these new technologies. And he lists the following 11 digital literacies. And I think it really is way beyond basic ICT skills. We really need quite complex and sophisticated literacies to be able to effectively engage with these new technologies. And add on to that a level in terms of academic uh, literacies. For example, judgment translates into how will a learner know that a particular OER is good, is relevant for their particular learning context at that time. How can uh, they be part of an effective distributed cognition worldwide and accessing other peers and learners? And I would add a 12th literacy in terms of creativity. And uh, with colleagues from um, Arush University yesterday, we ran a really nice symposium on uh, creativity. And there were some very interesting discuss discussions. And this is part of some work um, 
uh, by a group called iCreaNet, and we're hoping to carry on this work. If anybody's interested in particular in creativity and new technologies, please do get in touch with us and um, become part of our growing network. So that's the link to the website at the bottom. But there are paradoxes associated with these new technologies as well as, as opportunities. Pandora's box is truly open. What does it mean to adopt these more open practices? Here are some of the paradoxes. And again, this follows on nicely from the kind of things that Rory was saying in terms of technologies. Firstly, despite the potential of these technologies and the potential of OER, as we heard this morning in the panel, they're not being extensively used. Uh, Patrick McAndrew and colleagues at the Open University did a detailed evaluation of the Open Learn Initiative uh, in terms of their repository of open educational resources, and they discovered there was a lack of uptake of OER by teachers, by learners. Going back to Roger's famous um, uh, spectrum curve, if you like, little evidence of use beyond the early adopters. We haven't got mainstream with using these technologies yet. And going back to the very well-cited work of Cubans and more recently the work of um, Ulf Ulius, despite the rhetoric about um, um, funding for OER and for technologies generally, despite the huge amount of initiatives that have been around with this, despite the significant investment, there's little evidence of true transformation. So this has been at the heart of some work that um, uh, uh, I was involved with at the Open University and I'm now planning to carry on at Leicester. And I'm very grateful uh, for strategic funding from the Open University to initiate uh, this work about uh, five years ago. Um, it's since been complemented by funding from the JISC in the UK and by a number of projects in the European Union. And essentially, the heart of the methodology is a research-based design approach to creating and supporting courses. And I just wanted to thank some of the colleagues at the OU who've been involved in aspects of this work. There are others as well. So essentially, with this methodology, we're looking to shift teachers' design practice for one that's belief-based, implicit, to one that's much more explicit, and we argue that that means it will encourage reflection and scholarly practice and helps promote the sharing and discussing of learning and teaching ideas. So what we've been doing is setting up a whole new area for this. And, and this is just um, a, an outline of the, the book that I mentioned, which I'm, touch wood, hoping to submit in the, in the next few weeks. And in that book, I try to outline the uh, methodology and how we've been using it. And the first few chapters uh, look at the broader context of the theory and methodology of learning design and more broadly uh, e-learning, what does it draw on. It also positions the work alongside related uh, areas such as instructional sciences, such as the learning sciences. And then it provides a review of social and participatory media and some of their key characteristics. I've highlighted that in red because that's one of the topics I've been talking about uh, today. Theoretically, it draws on two areas, the notion of mediating artefacts from activity theory. I'm not going to talk in particular about that today, but the notion that we have shared artefacts that we can use to guide our design, that we can use to share our design practice with, with others. And the notion of affordances, which I've already mentioned. And then that translates into a set of tangible outputs, tools, resources, workshops, etc., and we've created a number of design representations, and I'm going to just briefly uh, describe those, as well as some uh, tools for um, uh, visualizing the de designs. We've critiqued the notion of openness. We've reviewed open educational practices, as I described this morning, and I described some of the work that the OU's been doing in terms of the OLNET initiative on open educational resources, and also the OPAL project that those of you who came to the panel this morning heard me talk about. Finally, we go into detail on the nature of new communities and interactions in these online spaces and also just go on to describe, finally, a new social networking site that we've developed, Cloudworks, to enable teachers to share and discuss learning and teaching ideas. So what are these visualizations? I'm not going to go through them in detail, but just to give you a very broad overview, we've developed five. We have a course map, you won't be able to read this, but I can make the slides available afterwards, which essentially allows a teacher to think of the four higher level components related to a course. What guidance and support is provided? 
what content and activities are the students engaged with, what communications and collaborations are they interacting with their peers, with their tutors, and finally, what kind of reflection and demonstration is in the course? What kind of summative assessment is there? Are there any diagnostic exercises? So it enables the teacher very quickly to develop an at-a-glance view of a course. We have a learning outcomes view, which enables the teacher to list the things that the students will be doing and then map them to the learning outcomes and so that they can see, are there any learning outcomes missed? So, for example, if there's a learning outcome to do with collaboration and the students aren't doing any activities to do with collaboration or any assessments to do with um, a collaboration, then that's missing. Either that learning outcome needs to be taken out or you need to put in place some activities to cover it. We have a pedagogy profile, which enables the teacher to think about the different kind of tasks the students are doing. How much time are they spending reading, viewing, or listening to things? How much time are they communicating? How much time are they engaging with information handling? And again, the profile gives you a nice, very nice picture of what uh, the course is about. I did two courses at the Open University in Spanish. And I recommend any of you who are teachers and researchers in online and distance and, and, and education, go and be a learner yourself. I've learned more by being a learner at the Open University than I have in all the years of researching it. How difficult it is to be an adult learner, how frightening it can be at times, how upsetting it is when you get a bad assessment. But one of the interesting things is I did a pedagogy profile of my own learning experience uh, on the course. And interestingly, the column um, that was smallest for me was communication. And in my Spanish, that is my weakest skill. So there was a direct correlation, which is the amount of activities I was engaging with and what I was experiencing in terms of level of confidence um, of, of uh, a learner. Now, wouldn't it be interesting to use these kind of profiles, not just as teacher designers, but also with students and to compare what the student's experience actually is with what the teachers are designing? We have a course dimensions map, which just gives you a more detailed breakdown of the course map, and you get a little spider uh, diagram. So it gives you an indication of how much collaboration there is, how much user-generated content there is, how much reflective activities there are, etc. And you can get a nice spider diagram, which gives you a breakdown across those four categories in the course map. And finally, there's a task swim lane view where we list the tasks and the things that the students are going to do and alongside that we list what resources or tools they're using and in the final column whether there are any tutor interactions. So for example, it might be students are asked to discuss in a forum and the tutor's role is to moderate that forum or maybe summarise it at the end. And we see these five uh, views as being very interrelated, a way of kind of connecting and iterating between them. Because when we talked to teachers about their design practice, we found it was messy, iterative, and creative. And these course views enable the teachers to think beyond content, to think of student activities, to think of the student experience. As part of um, a course business models project at the um, OU, uh, in addition to some of these views, uh, the OU has also produced two very interesting data-driven views. So in addition to designing, thinking about, okay, what's the real experience of the students? What kind of course performance is there? What kind of evaluations are the students giving back? What kind of retention rates? So it's no good designing a wonderfully wacky uh, course that is beautiful in terms of use of Web2 technologies. It's, it's the re reality is that you've got very bad student re uh, retention or you're getting very bad evaluation from the students. And the second view is the financial view. How financially viable is the course? And that's work that's been taken forward by Mick Jones, uh, Martin Weller, and other colleagues at the Open University. What about collaboration? What kind of activities can we engage with in order to enable teachers to collaborate? Again, when we asked teachers, what would make you use technologies more? What would help you? They said two things really strongly. Give me examples that I can use, preferably from my own discipline, and give me people to talk to. Probably the best thing about this conference has been the coffee conversation you've had with a colleague where they said, oh, I did this really interesting thing with a wiki with my student. And you think, oh, yes, I, I might try that. So our practice is very much dialogic in terms of the way in which we interact with others and get ideas. And so we've tried to... Uh, elicit that or hold on to that uh, wish uh, list, if you like, from teachers in two ways, through face-to-face -face events and also through our online social networking site. 
So in terms of face-to-face -face, uh, events, at the Open University, um, we run a number of times very successfully something called the Design Challenge. And the challenge is that teams are tasked with... The course has been phenomenally successful, and all of those who participated were really positive about how it helped structure the design and help them get much further in terms of what they were doing. But it was also beneficial for the people who were on the expert stalls. Suddenly, the keeper of the learning management system understood why these academics wanted to do something in Moodle. So it really did benefit both the academics and the support staff who engaged with it. Leicester University has uh, developed something similar called a Carpe Diem uh, workshop, and this is a two-day design workshop where, again, people come up with a storyboard of their designs, and they've run those in lots of different contexts. In terms of online uh, spaces to facilitating the sharing and discussing and learning and, and teaching, we've created a site called Cloudworks, which is a space to enable teachers to share and discuss learning and teaching ideas. And that's now being used worldwide. Um, we've got people from 80-odd countries involved. We've got policymakers, teachers, learners, uh, people from across the educational spectrum. We've got school teachers in Argentina talking to higher education lecturers in Canada. So it really is crossing the boundaries, and we're seeing a vibrant set of ecologies emerging in the site in terms of the ways in which the site is being used to support learning and teaching, to say, here's a great resource I had, and this is how I've used it. Here's some great tools that we've used in this way. This is the way in which we're fostering problem-based learning, for example. So do go and have a look. The site is free. Uh, if you want to add anything to it, you need to register, but if you just want to look, uh, you don't need to register. And there's also an open source version of the site called Cloud Engine, so it could be taken by any of you and reused in your own context or uh, as a space to discuss and share anything else. So the Carpe Diem uh, workshops build on the work of Gilly Salmon, who was my predecessor uh, at Leicester, in terms of the notion of storyboarding a set of activities that she calls e-activities and the associated uh, resources, uh, uh, as well as mapping the learning outcomes and aligning the assessments. So these are just some of the ways in which we've been exploring how we can share and support teachers in terms of making more effective use of these new technologies, which are pedagogically good. But do they work? As I mentioned, we've been lucky enough to have funding through the JISC, a curriculum design project, big four-year project um, based at the OU, and we've been working with colleagues in four other institutions uh, in the UK. As part of a Leonardo-funded EU project design practice, we've been taking these tools, resources, and workshops out to colleagues in Cyprus and Greece, and that project's just finished. Uh, this is a a picture of, of one of the mediating artefacts produced from the visualization designs. And this is actually the course view where uh, teachers are mapping out the guidance, support, content and activities, communication and collaboration, and reflection and demonstration associated with the course. So they get it on a big piece of paper and they write in and fill, fill these boxes. Well, let's hear from some of the participants uh, what their experience has been. I found the documentation quite thought-provoking, especially as a starting point in this journey for developing good understandings. One of the things we know from following teachers and from interviewing them is that they work from content primarily. They work from their own expertise. So the whole point about these conceptual views is to get them to think beyond content, as I said before, to get them to think about the activities the students are engaged with, the kind of outcomes and experiences we want the students to have. It is iterative and so helps with ironing out any issues. What we see really strongly with these design views is it enables teachers not only to make their design explicit, not only to guide the design and think about the key components that they need to think about, but also it highlights gaps and issues with these different views so that they can start to iteratively improve their design practice over time. And of course it also means that by making these design views explicit, they can be shared with somebody else. So I can produce something and give it to you and you can look at it and try and replicate what I've done. And a third example, I could understand the learning design process and would feel able to use this when designing some other learning activities. So we've got lots and lots of rich evaluation data, literally just hot off the press, uh, from these projects, which is giving us um, encouragement that these really are making a difference. Um, Mick Jones, who I mentioned, um, uh, organized, of course, business models uh, project in the OU. Uh, we ran some courses um, 
some of the early prototypes of these with his faculty about five years ago. And I asked Mick a couple of years later, I said, did it make any difference? And he said, well, you know, the tool you showed us, Compendium LD for visualizing designs, we're not really using that in the faculties. So that, that wasn't so important. He said, but what I have seen definitely is a shift in teachers' thinking and the way in which they're talking about design. He said, they're no longer talking about content, they're talking about activities. So that, to me, was a real success. That showed evidence of impact. So I want to turn in the, the last part of the talk to just giving you a flavour of some of the exciting possibilities, some of the kind of ways in which these technologies can be used. And I'm drawing in particular on the way, uh, work of Terry Mays and uh, Sarah De Freitas in the UK, who did a very nice review of different e-learning pedagogies in 2004. And I've provided an update of that uh, in, in the paper last year. So they talk about associative pedagogies, which focus on the individual, learning through association and reinforcement, constructivist learning approaches, building on prior experience, task-based uh, um, uh, and orientated, situative, learning in a context, learning with others. And finally, George Siemens and Stephen Downs have recently coined, um, or in the last few years, talked about the notion of connectivism, and they argue there's also something about learning in a networked environment. Uh, <coughs> and for each of these, we can map out the ways in which different technologies can be used to support them. So we can have e-assessment and drill and practice, inquiry-based learning, experiential problem-based and role-play, and finally, connectivism, I would argue, can be used to support reflective, dialogic, and personalised learning. So Rory's already mentioned something about mobile learning. We're seeing increasingly the value and importance. In the OU, um, the courses are dominated by the course calendar. And when it was paper-based, you've got a great big A3 piece of paper which you stick on your wall and it told you when you had to do all your assignments. And now our colleagues in KMI, uh, the Knowledge Media Institute, have produced a version for mobile devices. We're increasingly seeing the value of e-books and, and different kinds of online resources. In terms of resource-based learning more generally, um, I won't go through this in detail, but we've seen the growth of um, the open educational resource movement. Uh, the OU has been phenomenally successful in terms of the use of iTunes U for podcasts. And rather than this mitigating against their main business model, it's seen a translation of students then coming on um, uh, to, to actually do OU courses. Um, Alan, uh, Alan Tate this morning referred to this as a shop window in terms of getting a taster for what the course uh, offers. And as I talked this morning, uh, we've been involved in a project called OPAL. ICDE is also involved in that initiative, which is looking at the practices around the creation and use of OER. And iSpot is an interesting project. Okay. Okay, I, I need to wrap up now. Apparently, time's passed. I'm just going to finish by um, just flicking through some more examples. Open courses, the work that um, George Siemens and others are doing in terms of massive online courses. Uh, Rory talked about open accreditation, and we heard on the first keynote the notion of badges, things like the peer-to-peer -peer university. We're really seeing very rich new forms available. Um, we're doing some nice work in Leicester in terms of the use of virtual genetics labs in Second Life. Uh, work of Mike Sharples and Eileen Scanlon in the OU have looked at inquiry-based learning. We've got role play. And also there's been interesting work in terms of the notion of new learning spaces. So we're seeing a very, very rich set of different pedagogies and ways in which technologies can support them. So I'll finish by arguing I think the learners of tomorrow will be, are already technologically immersed. They're using a range of new learning approaches and personalizing their digital learning environment. And they're going to increasingly use a mixture of institutional systems and cloud-based tools, as well as the use of, of free courses and materials. I think the opportunities are exciting, but they're also challenging. Thank you for listening.